training. Hopefully you've all um, had your baskets of goodies and you're all set up and prepared. Um, I'm Katie O'Brien, I'm in the Brighter team. Um, we look after the capital region in the UK. You've got um, the lovely Kylie and Grace and Georgia, and I think Debbie will be joining shortly, who you all know. Um, so we're here, um, drop us a line afterwards if you have any questions. Um, but we have, of course, our capital region experts um, who will be um, taking over very shortly. Um, you should have all received your very lovely baskets. Um, I know George has sent across some sort of housekeeping bits yesterday. So just to check, you've got your paper towels, your glasses for your cocktail, your ice, um, your knife to cut your lime and juicer if you have one. Um, so hopefully everyone's all set up and ready to go. Um, we've sent out press packs to you all already. Um, but as I said, any questions as we're going through, pop them in the Q&A section or if anyone has any funny comments while you're going through of uh, how you're getting on. Um, but we will have a bit of a Q&A at the end. So please feel free, feel free to um, ask any questions that you have then. Um, I know the team also sent across the social media details. Um, I've seen some of you posting some lovely bits of your baskets today as well. So um, please do feel free to post um, using at the Capital Region USA and the hashtags and you have the details for um, the partner regions, the Maryland, Virginia and DC and of course um, our fabulous experts that we have here today. Um, so I think that's all for me. I will hand over to Scott. Um, Scott is the Executive Director of the Capital Region USA and we will get started. Thank you, Scott. Well, thank you, Kate. And thank you to everyone who's able to join us this evening from the UK. Uh, certainly appreciate it, as Kate said. I'm Scott Ballio, uh, Executive Director of uh, Capital Region USA, which is a nearly 25 year partnership between Maryland, Virginia and Washington DC. Uh, working together to promote the region to international visitors. Uh, our region is known for amazing history, landscapes and national parks, arts and culture, museums, outdoor adventures, and as you'll learn tonight, an amazing culinary scene. And while sadly you cannot travel to the capital region right now, we wanted to bring a small taste of it into your homes for what should be a fun, interactive evening and hopefully whet your appetite for trips to come. Before we get started, just uh, wanted to do a quick introduction of our U.S. Uh, colleagues who are with us today. Kimberly Peterson and Stacy Sheets uh, from our CRUSA U.S. office are on, uh, and as always, do a great job of helping pull these things together. Uh, and then, of course, our representatives from our partner destinations. Um, each of you will be hearing from them here shortly. Christy Braggington, International Media Relations Manager from the Virginia Tourism Corporation, uh, Vanessa Casas Ryan, International Media Relations Destination DC. Leslie Troy, Public Relations Manager, Maryland Office of Tourism Development. Uh, again, my thanks to Grace Armitage and everyone with the Brighter Group. Uh, they do a great job of rep representing us uh, uh, to the press in the UK. And obviously, as what has been a very challenging year, uh, have continued to keep the lights on and promote the region. Um, and so, we are lucky to be home to some of the best oysters in the world. And later on, you'll be meeting one of the people partly responsible for bringing oysters back to the Chesapeake Bay and making it the thriving colony it is today. We're also famous for Maryland blue crabs. And we wanted to show you how the experts crack their crabs uh, and uh, learn how to make Washington DC's signature cocktail, the gin Ricky from an absolute expert as well. Obviously we can't wait to welcome Brits back to the region. Uh, and we've introduced some exciting new products for the year. Um, including, uh, we know that many travelers are going to be wanting to connect with their families on future trips. So we worked with tour operator Bon Voyage to create a new multi-generational package for grandparents, parents, and children to travel through the region together. Uh, another trend that we know is uh, popular or is going to be popular is people wanting to travel uh, in RVs, uh, campers and caravans, and so demand for those trips is soaring. Uh, and in light of this, we've worked with Vacations to America to produce a brand new RV road trip, uh, holiday taking in Maryland, Virginia, and DC for those of you who want to hit the open road, get out and experience our diverse region. I'll let the partners tell you more about the exciting anniversaries and openings we have in store for the year ahead. Uh, we'll have an informal Q&A uh, at the end, so stay on if you're able uh, and like any ask any questions that you'd like our team to answer. Uh, you can do that verbally at the Q&A. You can also during it, do it during the presentation uh, in the chat box. Uh, just a couple of additional housekeeping notes. Please make sure that your settings are switched to speaker view and that your microphones are muted. Uh, however, we'd love for you to be leave your cameras on if you're comfortable doing that, uh, especially during the interactive portions of this evening's event. 
So again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, appreciate you hanging in there with us and, uh, and covering the Capital Region again. Uh, looking forward to the day when we can welcome you back in person. Uh, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to Christy Braggington with the Virginia Tourism Corporation. So Christy, take it away. Hi all, thank you, Scott, and welcome. We appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, in a few minutes, Ryan Cruxton with Rappahannock Oyster Company will be here to provide some tips on opening those tasty oysters you have in front of you. But first, I have just a little information on Virginia. Um, beyond our extensive shared history with you lovely Brits, Virginia is for lovers of food, wine, craft beer, music, and great outdoors. From our more than 100 miles of coastline to the sweeping mountain views of Shenandoah National Park and the Blue Ridge Parkway. Upon arrival to the capital region, access to and from the international airport to points in Virginia, Maryland, and DC is easy via Metrorail. It will become even easier this year with the extension of the Silver Line, providing direct service between Dulles International in Virginia and downtown DC. Additionally, the new line provides easier access into DC's wine country in Loudoun County, Virginia. America's train service, Amtrak, celebrates their 50th anniversary this year and offers a brilliant way to discover the region, including parts of Maryland, Washington, DC, and numerous cities throughout Virginia from the mountains to the coast. New hotels continue to open throughout Virginia to note just a few of them. The Glasslight Hotel and Gallery in Norfolk's historic rail district features glassworks from renowned artists. That's that cute bunny you see there. The Sessions Hotel in Bristol, which is the official birthplace of country music, offers guests a unique music experience. The Liberty Trust Hotel in Roanoke will be housed in an original 1910 bank headquarters and even incorporates the old vault into the new space. Delta Hotels Virginia Beach Bayfront Suites offers its own private beach. And later this year, the opening of the reimagined historic Keswick Hall near Charlottesville will feature a new restaurant from acclaimed French chef, Jean-Georges Van Grechten. I know I said that wrong. New attractions in Virginia include the National Museum of the United States Army, which features a groundbreaking 300 degree sensory theater and an interactive discovery zone and the Virginia Maple Syrup Trail, where foodies can learn how syrup is made. In a nod to Virginia's great outdoors, <clears throat> Virginia's mountain bike trail made Lonely Planet's Best in Travel 2021 list as a sustainable cycling route. And while it isn't on a slide, I should mention that 2021 is the 50th anniversary of performances at Wolf Trap, which is the only US national park dedicated to the performing arts. For more details on what I mentioned and other new offerings in Virginia, you'll have a press release in your media pack, and we invite you to visit the What's New section on our press room at virginia.org. There's a lot to love in a Virginia vacation, not the least of which is our outstanding oysters. Before Rappahannock Oyster Company owner Ryan Cruxton takes over to show you some tips for shucking the oysters you have in front of you, we have a brief video that gives you background on Ryan's company and the amazing comeback of the Virginia oyster. Can you roll the video? A single oyster is gonna filter about 50 to 60 gallons of water a day. So, I mean, add that up in the course of a three year lifespan, what that's able to do. We tell people that for every oyster of ours that, that you eat, we put 12 back over into the water next year. So it's one of the best things you can actually do for the environment is to eat farm-raised oysters. So in effect, I mean, you eat a dozen oysters and you've effectively sponsored, you know, a million gallons of, of filtered water. I'm Ryan Croxton. I'm Travis Croxton. We're cousins and oyster farmers. And we're here today at the mouth of the Rappahannock River, just as it approaches the Chesapeake Bay in the great state of Virginia. Rappahannock means where the tide ebbs and flows. And the Chesapeake historically means the uh, Great Shellfish Bay. 
2001, which is when we got into the business, it was the absolute low for the Chesapeake Bay. I think we harvested about 21,000 bushels versus the 20 million bushels we were doing in 1880s. And that's, that's what we started with, was the bay at its absolute low. That means there was absolutely no industry to support. So when we got back into this, you were basically reinventing an industry that was, you know, long since gone. There weren't trucks, there, were, there was no infrastructure to move oysters because there weren't oysters. We didn't even have an idea of actually starting a business. It was just, let's do this to kind of resurrect the memory of our, our grandfather. And as we got into it, we learned that we had a chance to actually resurrect the, the Chesapeake. When we came into Oysters back in 2001 and we were starting to do our investigation, the conversation of the day was really around, one, putting the native species on the endangered species list. That's how bad it had gotten. And then two, there was talk about introducing a non-native species. At no point did we ever feel like um, introducing a non-native species was the, was the right step. And, you know, call us nostalgic because we were, you know, holding on to our great-grandfather and grandfather's oyster company. But it was also, it just felt like a, we hadn't exhausted all the hope that could be had for, for the uh, native species. Aquaculture hadn't been, hadn't been tried, you know, on, on scale. We try and teach people that, you know, aquaculture comes in various shades. And this is one of those rare instances where aquaculture is really a good word. And the reason is because the way we grow our oysters is using the natural process. We use the natural water. Our cultured product grows right next to a wild product. It eats the same food. It lives in the same environment. The only thing that's different is that it's literally in a cage. And since they're, you know, inert animals, it's not like we're re prohibiting them from free range. They're, they're going to stay still no matter where they are. So this, this actually gives them better access to food. So the benefit of aquaculture versus uh, wild harvest is that we're not dredging the bottom, scraping up the bottom, tearing up grasses, pulling all kinds of bycatch. We're able to grow these in cages that have feet on them that actually elevate them from the bottom. So it keeps them out of the mud where they get cleaner, clearer water to be able to filter. Uh, and they're also just not gonna have that grit in them that they would otherwise. Uh, when we go to extract them to, to actually harvest, we're not damaging anything to get them out. We literally just lift them up and we're able to work the cage and put the cage back. So the Chesapeake, we were able to actually rescue the native oyster before we lost the wild populations. And today there are really only two wild populations um, left in the world where you can still harvest wild. And that's the Gulf of Mexico and the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we had to kind of help lead the wave, the, we call it the oyster renaissance of the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, we're happy to actually say that right now there's probably like a couple hundred oyster companies doing what we can do, which is fantastic because more oysters in the bay, a cleaner bay, a better bay for everybody. Okay, Ryan, or nope, sorry, not Ryan. Yeah, Ryan, take it away. Oh, I'm watching a video on yourself. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna kind of just jump right into this and first start talking about species, which uh, was kind of alluded to as the Chrysostra virginica. The species you actually have in front of you is um, is gigas, gigas, depending on how you want to say it, which is actually a Japanese variety. Um, and a lot of aquaculture is really about the, um, unfortunately, the practice came about when we got to the point where we had exhausted our native supplies and had to look at bringing a foreign oyster in. And so what you actually have in front of you is a perfect example of, of why aquaculture had to start. Um, so Jagus was brought in, um, actually was brought into Europe around the, um, the Japanese oyster because the local oyster the flat oyster, Eudalus, which is what's native to England um, and uh, most of Europe, is, uh, is somewhat of a temperamental, slow-growing oyster, and it's actually been over-harvested, so you don't have um, very many of them. So about 90% of your oysters coming out of Europe are going to be um, jagus, which is what you have. Um, the reason I point that out um, is because shucking them is a little bit different. Uh, every animal is, is going to be different, even though they're um, similar species. The, Chrysostra virginica, particularly the way we grow them with aquaculture, tends to give them a nice consistent shape. Uh, when they grow in the wild, you'll get stuff like this, which is two oysters fused together, or oysters growing around a corner, um, just all kinds of crazy looking things if you don't, if you don't manage them. 
But if you do manage them, then you end up getting oysters like this, which you know give a nice consistent shape and then honestly give you a perfect hinge to shuck. Um, in the cases where you're shucking a wild oyster, that hinge is gonna give you a lot of trouble. Sometimes it could be curved, called like a toenail, um, or it can be super thin, like a, what we call a witch finger. Um, not gonna yield a lot of meat and it's gonna just provide a brittle shell, which will probably shed. Um, species is, is really a, a, a big deal because I think, uh, and I'm not looking at yours, but in my history of Jagus, you tend to have a little bit more of a curl um, to the Jagus species where this tends to be a little bit more of a flatter shell. Um, could be wrong in some of those examples, but that's kind of the tendency of it. So you might have a little bit harder time than I do um, getting into this. And so first of all, we can just talk about like why, why raw versus cooked. So actually in, um, in Europe, um, most, most Europeans are used to raw. Uh, in America, we have a little bit of both. Uh, we obviously inherit, but um, historically the Native Americans um, cooked our oysters. And the reason was because Crustacea virginica, when, it, when it's allowed to grow for as long as it wants, which can be 20 to 30 years, will actually grow quite large. So you'll get oysters that are this big. And so to try and shuck something, much less try and eat something like that raw, uh, it's a bit much. So Native Americans, rather than bash them with tools, just I think we might be having open. some trouble with Ryan's what we're ultimately bandwidth here, slightly. Which is called the um, that you can um, kill the Yeah, you know what? If everybody would turn off their camera, oh. camera yeah. I bet that be that would that. help this, you know, become better. I think we're sucking too much bandwidth. Sorry, Ryan, I don't know if you heard that. Thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not sure if, if Ryan can. All right. Yep, there we go. I think it's so basically that's keeping the shells closed, the two pieces of shell closed. You got me? Yeah. Are we uh, good? I heard you, yep. Yeah. Is it better, everybody? I'll All right. Mine is um, lost. All right. So I think maybe uh, if Ryan comes out and comes back in now with everyone's cameras off, that maybe we may have to do that because I think he's frozen. I'm not sure whatever what others are seeing. Did you hear that, Ryan? Is that any better? The joys of Zoom technology. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think there's, it, it looks like maybe the, there are some bandwidth issues. Um, uh, Stacy had just texted me and said that um, Virginia, that uh, if he's on Verizon's service in Virginia, that they're, they're having some, some issues. So um, what we might want to do is maybe give Ryan a few more seconds here, and then I don't know if we can yes. circle, try to yeah. circle back to him. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Ryan, we still can't see you. Uh, I keep turning my video on and off. Is that helping? Yeah, yep. it just so, yeah. Yeah. Ryan, maybe do the bits can you that you me? can do without visual. Um, and then anything you need to show on video, just turn your camera on for that bit. <laughs> I don't know. I know it's all very visual, but. <laughs> uh, how to shuck an oyster blind. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, maybe we should, you know, maybe we should go on to um, DC. Ryan, are you, do you have the ability to stay with us so the whole time? Ryan, did you hear that? Are you I did. So I, yeah, why don't we why don't we circle back yeah. to you and hope that in the in yeah, I do point. Okay, yeah, Vanessa, if you're if you're comfortable, um, if if you and Alan are comfortable doing your segment now, yeah. um, that'll hopefully get Ryan a chance to maybe log off, log back in, and hopefully his connectivity will improve, uh, so we can circle back to the to the oyster demo if that works for everybody. 
Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thanks, Vanessa. All right. Um, thank you, Scott and Christy. <laughs> and thank you all for spending some time with us today. While we can't wait to resume travel and do this in person someday, it's certainly great to see you all virtually. We're excited to start the year off with a fresh website. Visit visitors to the revamped Washington.org will experience optimized navigation as well as up-to-date information about DC, including the latest travel status and safety measures we have in place. New long form stories, photography, and video also create an interactive experience while on the site. I encourage you all to visit our revamped press room for continued story inspiration that we update frequently. Next slide, please. Washington DC will celebrate a number of arts and culture anniversaries in 2021. The Smithsonian Institution consisting of 17 museums, galleries, as well as a national zoo celebrates its 175th anniversary. Its original site, the Arts and Industries Building, will reopen to the public with its first major public exhibit in 40 years. Titled Futures, the exhibit will showcase prototypes, robots, speculative fiction, and new worlds, among other things. We are eagerly awaiting to hear how the rest of the museums will incorporate the anniversary. America's first museum of modern art, the Phillips Collection, which opened in 1921 in the historic DuPont Circle neighborhood, celebrates 100 years. They have already announced a robust list of programming for the upcoming year, including their local artist collaboration. They've asked 12 local artists to reimagine the Phillips Centennial logo in their own style. The first one you see here by local artist Dominic Rayburn. Their first centennial exhibit and the centerpiece of their anniversary will be called Seeing Differently, the Phillips Collects for a New Century. It provides a fresh perspective on over 200 major works by artists from the 19th century. And it's scheduled to open February 20th and running through September. As Christy noted, Amtrak celebrates 50 years. Incorporated in DC in 1971, Amtrak operates out of Union Station, one of DC's most iconic, places receiving over 40 million visitors every year. Oh, Georgia, can you go back to the, <laughs> the previous slide? Um, it's also one of the city's most beautiful examples of neoclassical architecture. A living, breathing memorial dedicated to the 35th president, the city's most revered performance space, the Kennedy Center, turns 50 years old this year. While we wait to hear on their big anniversary plans, I invite you all to check out uh, the performances they have on their digital stage which can be accessed through their website. And finally, created by an act of Congress in 1896, the DC Public Library Institution celebrates their 125th anniversary. They're planning a year long commemoration anchored by the newly renovated Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library in downtown DC, which reopened just a few months ago. The new library features a rooftop garden, which you can see here, as well as a kid's slide that greets visitors upon entry. Uh, next slide now. Uh, Washington DC has seen several hotels open over the past 12 months. There are some familiar brands like Citizen M and the Yotel with their minimalist room designs and their self-service check-ins, as well as hotels with unique themes like Hotel Zena, the first, uh, the first hotel focused on female empowerment. Here you can see a portrait of the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg that hangs in the lobby and is actually made from 20,000 uh, feminine products. <laughs> so very uh, female empowered. Um, we'll see at least three new ho hotels open this year, including the Venn at Embassy Row with social spaces inspired by Scandinavian design, as well as a rooftop pool and bar. They're slated to open before the end of the month. And the Cap Cambria Capital Riverfront which opens next month uh, with rooftop views of the US Capitol building. Next slide. Here are some editorial things that I wanted to highlight for the coming year. We've had several new attractions that opened in 2020 that have yet to be experienced by international travelers. We had Planet Word, a museum showcasing the immense power of language through interactive exhibits, as well as the MLK Library that I mentioned and the National Children's Museum, dedicated to children, of course, but with a focus on STEAM learning. We'll look at how 
DC's key events will be reimagined this year to align with safety protocols. The National Cherry Blossom Festival and our annual Funk Parade have already announced plans for a hybrid event, which will include both virtual and in-person programming. Washington, D.C. is the capital free. We know budgets will be tight for many travelers. From the Smithsonian's that I mentioned earlier to the outdoor monuments and memorials, as well as our murals and parks, there's plenty for visitors to experience in D.C. free of charge. Uh, we'll focus on the juxtaposition of historic and new. For example, visitors can learn about African-American history at the museums and then stroll through the new Black Lives Matter Plaza. And as you know, dining is always a big focus for us. We've seen an increased uh, trend in food halls over the past uh, year throughout our neighborhoods, as well as pop-ups that have turned permanent. And now speaking of food and beverage, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Alan Grublauskas, a beverage director at one of my favorite DC restaurants, Boya Mel. Alan is also a gin Ricky and He's going to show us how to make DC signature cocktail. Alan. Hey, good evening. Welcome in everyone. Welcome to our nation's capital, Washington, DC. Um, so we're here to talk about the gin Ricky. Not only do we take our food seriously, we also take our cocktail seriously. The Ricky has been around since the early 1880s, so it is definitely a standard for us here. Um, we not only have the great culinary scene, we have a DC Craft Bartenders Guild, um, and we have named July National uh, Ricky Month for us here. Uh, we even do our own riffs or our own takes on the Gin Ricky, so, um, and we do a competition which gets a winner, which gets to be Ricky champion for the entire year. Um, so Colonel Joe Ricky went to the Shoemaker Hotel, which is no longer with us, but um, his original order, he called it his morning's morning. So he'd wake up, he'd have one nugget of ice, a wine glass full of whiskey, and some soda water to start off his day every time. Um, eventually, as the temperatures rose and things changed, eventually imparted a little bit of lime and changed the whiskey over to gin. So what we're working with today for our gin is going to be Green Hat, which is a, a locally D.C. distilled gin. It is the first distillery that returned to Washington, D.C. after the end of Prohibition. Um, so this has light notes of citrus, um, a little bit of coriander, and a touch of um, celery. So this will work really well with the simplistic ingredients that we have. Just want to make sure that we've got everything that we need in front of us. A little bit of gin, a little bit of soda or mineral water, of course your glass, lime, and a citrus juicer. If you don't have a citrus juicer, your hands will work just fine. Um, so going to the basics here, we're going to take our lime. We're going to go ahead and just cut that in half really quick. We are going to go ahead and throw it in that juicer, place it right over the glass, get all the juice that we can out of that half of the lime. We can go ahead and tilt it to the side. And one of the key things for us, for the Ricky enthusiasts, is we're gonna go ahead and take the shell and place it right in the glass. That will be the garnish, but it'll also give you all the essential oils from the shell itself, give you all the lime flavor that you can possibly get. We're gonna take your gin of choice, and I know that Everybody across the pond takes their gin very seriously. So whatever gin you fancy is your choice. Instead of doing a wine glass full of spirit, we're just gonna do a modest two ounces here. Enough to get your day going and to keep you happy all afternoon, or in your case, this evening. We're gonna go ahead and put those two ingredients into our glass. We're gonna go ahead and get our ice. Go ahead, keep everything nice and chilled. Very lovingly, some people around town actually call this the uh, liquid air conditioning for your nice hot summer days. Take your mineral water, your soda water, go ahead and top it off. And either give it a nice little roll around in the glass or if you happen to have a spoon, go ahead and stir it up so all the ingredients can be uh, integrated together. Then after that, go ahead and take your sip. It should be nice and delicious. So I'm coming to you um, from Oymel Cocina, as mentioned, um, part of the Jose Andreas uh, Think Food Group restaurant family. Um, Jose has been in Washington, D.C. Um, from Spain for about 28 years, um, imparting small plates, top of style, uh, to the D.C. area and abroad. Um, and he also is an amazing humanitarian, um, part of World Central Kitchen. Um, Jose and the team at World Central Kitchen um, help make sure that people all across the globe can get food when in need. 
Um, locally here uh, during the amazing inauguration that we had last week for one Joseph R. Biden. Um, we fed over 19,000 meals to the military police that were here. Um, and then up in New York City with a local, uh, uh, sorry, a semi-local outbreak of the coronavirus, we are currently feeding 15 different hospitals. Um, so there was some need out in Colorado, so we're operating in Denver. And to mention the worldwide portion, um, unfortunately, there were some a massive earthquakes in Indonesia, so we sent a team over to Indonesia. So it kind of speaks of the humanitarian efforts that Jose does. So not only does he take the Think Food Group family incredibly dear to heart, as that is what has made him such an acclaimed chef, but the humanitarian efforts that he can now focus on to make the world better and to change the world through the power of food. So I hope that the less is more, the simplistic gin Ricky cocktail, you know, finds everybody's palate as light, bright, and refreshing. Think about it on your warm summer days. And when you come back to see us here in DC over the summertime, hopefully we can travel by then, then we'll be able to see you and be able to enjoy a Ricky together. Thank you, Alan. That looks tasty. And I'm seeing a glimpse of everyone else's cocktail. Looks like everyone was able to follow along. Um, okay, so are we going to turn it over back to Ryan or? Yeah, why don't we, um, Ryan, it looks like you're able to get your stream back. So um, let's try to carry on. Christy, if that sounds good to you, we'll circle back to Ryan and, and then go on to Maryland from there. Sounds great. We're back. Take it away, Ryan. All right, everybody can hear me, see me. We're all full. Okay, good. Uh, so I think where I left this off, I recall, uh, and sorry if I lost some of you, uh, we're talking about species and about the fact that some of the species are gonna deliver you a, a different shucking angle. So you may approach some of them a little differently and, and cultured oysters versus wild oysters are also gonna yield something different. As I was showing earlier, a wild oyster can be a kind of a crazy beast and that requires some real skill to get into, or sometimes it doesn't because you don't really care about how it turns out. Um, and you know some of the really narrow ones, uh, but a cultured oyster is always gonna be pretty consistent and, and deliver up, you up a pretty good hinge to shuck with. So we can talk about a couple of the tools to get in. Uh, I have a, I mean, this, somebody made this out of a, I think it was a railroad spike. Um, this is, this is a really pretty one, which I have to say doesn't really work that well, but it's really pretty. Um, this, I mean, screwdriver, I, that really doesn't matter. This is a really nice one made uh, by a, a company down in South Carolina called Toadfish that has just a nice little curve to it. I like the curve because it gives you a, um, a little bit of an angle to work with because most of shucking is not pressure. It's, um, or it's, it's not strength. It's just um, positioning and twisting. Um, my favorite though it has to be, and I'm not trying to push, but it's, it's the knife that we make, which is, it's called a Chesapeake Stabber. It's just got a really long, thin blade. And the reason I like it is because it, it gives you the least amount of um, resistance to the shell. So you're, you're really just prying in a small place. And then your only objective is to slip in here and cut that adductor muscle. Because once you cut the muscle that's holding the shells um, together, it falls apart which is why if, if this is all a failed effort, you can always just resort to cooking it because the second you kill it, it will pop open on its own. Um, so a couple of the techniques that um, are popular, probably the most popular is going to be the, the hinge method, which is the one I'll go through in a second. Another um, method that is actually used by a lot of speed shuckers, um, used by a lot of super really good shuckers, professionals, um, is what they call lip shucking, which is actually going through, um, going through the lip of the oyster right here. And if you find, if you scrape right along here, you can, you can see between the layers, there's a layer that you can enter and then just push right through. Very dangerous, don't expect you to do it unless you have practiced this a long time and certainly don't expect you to do this into your hand. So rule number one with shucking is do everything on a table for the first year. Um, so we're gonna go back to hinge shucking because that while really interesting is a really difficult um, technique. So with hinge shucking, Pretty simple, just place your order flat, uh, place your oyster flat on a um, terry cloth or something like that. And then just position it to where you can hold it. And then the idea is really to, you wanna take your knife and you wanna put it right where the oyster um, separates, the two shells separate. And you just wanna get your knife in far enough that, that it sticks. And then it's a, then it's a twisting game. So you're not cracking it, because if you crack it, you might just blow out this bottom hinge. 
So the idea is really just to get it in far enough. And then again, don't do this in your hand. You're doing this on the table. I'm just doing this so you can see it. You're going to twist it. Well, I'm going to do it on here. You twist it very slightly, and then you can see the shell pop open. At this point, don't be um, nervous. About that. Don't be a purist at all the great juice. Actually, the original, the oyster liquor that runs out the first is not the one you want. You can actually shuck it any time, let all the juice come out. Um, I'll explain that in a second. So when you're when you're in here, you've got your knife that can go in there, just ride that top shell and you can hear it scraping. Just scrape that top shell and scrape the top muscle off. The second the top muscle scraped off, oyster falls apart. And that's it and you're in. Now you have another muscle that's stuck to the back of the shell. So you wanna scoop underneath it and shave that off. And then once you do that, if you, if you did a little bit of a hack job and you stab the meat, you can always flip it and you get a nice pretty shucked oyster. And that's that. Um, so options to not doing this, I mentioned you can always cook it. Um, you can freeze it. You can stick it in your freezer and then put it in your refrigerator. Uh, and then when it's back out, it will pop open because it's dead. Um, you can also, and I hate saying this because people are gonna, until you see the oyster shell pop, usually takes like about 10, 15 seconds. Um, generally not enough to get it too warm, but then you can put it back in the refrigerator and chill it back down. Uh, again, this is just, if you're in a hurry, you gotta get a bunch open and people are coming. That's a, a technique. Uh, I'd recommend the freezing if you've got time. Otherwise, you know, take your hand and shucking. Um, and then uh, I think I, you guys have a couple of um, topping options. I think you have some horseradish and some hot sauce and some lemon. Uh, my personal favorite is always going to be a little horseradish and um, lemon, just because it doesn't overwhelm the oyster, like cocktail sauce and stuff like that. I love, I love all that stuff and heap as much on there as you want. But if you're gonna try something for the first time, you really wanna taste the oyster. Up it, mask it, they kind of brighten it. Um, so that's a good way to try an oyster where it's not it's straight, but it, it gives it a little bit of a pop. Um, we actually have a little hot sauce that we make um, in, our, uh, in our restaurants. We have a, a number of restaurants uh, throughout the country. We have two in Virginia, one, uh, two in Angeles, uh, California. Um, and then, yeah, we sell some hot sauce and cocktail sauce, a bunch of different toppings that we do. So definitely uh, come see us sometime if you uh, are, are ever in the States. Um, and back to you, Kristen. Thanks, Ryan. I think we got the bulk of that. Hopefully everybody got a chance to try the oysters. And uh, Ryan's going to stick around so he can answer any specific questions that you have during the Q&A part. And with that, I'll introduce it now to Leslie Troy with Maryland Visit Maryland. Take it away, Les. All right, thanks, Christy. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. My name is Leslie Troy. I'm with the Maryland Office of Tourism where we are known for our blue crabs, um, but I will we'll get to that in just one moment. So just wanted to start off with just some major anniversaries that are happening in Maryland. Um, the first is our Chesapeake and Ohio Canal um, the park, which is more uh, widely known as the CNO Canal. And this year it is celebrating the 50th anniversary that it was designated as a historic national park. Um, and that is part of the National Park Service, um, as well as the 60th anniversary um, of it being designated, of the designation as a national monument. The canal itself, of course, is much, much older. It actually began construction um, in 1828 and was completed in 1850. Uh, but these are just significant of when it became part of the National Park Service. Um, and activities will be happening all year long. Uh, the actual anniversaries, as noted there, did just take place um, in, in this month. Uh, and there's not only will the park be celebrating um, things as well as a lot of other things within the region. Um, and then just another thing to note, just to plant the seed a little bit early here, is Harriet Tubman, who um, most of you are probably familiar with. She was uh, one of the conductors of the Underground Railroad. Uh, she is celebrating her 200th birthday next year in 2022, um, and that falls in March. Uh, so just something to keep on your tickler. Uh, Maryland is the most powerful storytelling destination in the world for the Underground Railroad, as we have uh, the 
a very significant number of national um, networks of freedom sites um, and there are still underground railroad sites that are still um, being certified officially um, through research and and all of that so uh, those are just some things to note um, and then moving on into uh, sort of what's new as I mentioned about the CNO canal in light of the anniversaries taking place this year um, something that we've kind of rebranded um, and is sort of new from a visitor perspective is the CNO canal experience um, and that just gives folks an opportunity to really explore uh, the region that surrounds the canal and the park. Um, and that is getting out onto our scenic byway. We have one that's specifically themed around the CNO Canal, um, as well as just getting out into the landscape. Um, something that's going to be fun that's launching next month in February is the CNO Canal Libations Trail. Um, it'll include all breweries, wineries, and distilleries that are part of that surrounding region and area. Um, but because February in Maryland is been coined as February, um, they're going to be kicking it off with the breweries first. And a lot of those breweries, and then of course the wineries and distilleries, have actually dedicated specific themed um, and named uh, brews around the canal itself, uh, which is, you know, fun, something different for the area. Um, and then in spring, the new headquarters are going to be launching um, and officially opening up, and that is the headquarters for the National Park Service with the CNO Canal itself. Um, and this is really significant because currently the CNO Canal headquarters are several, several, several miles off of the canal itself, and this actually places it right along the canal, and it gives, um, they'll have enhanced visitor experience and some um, exhibitions there, um, and they'll also have some rare vistas that had never been um, given the opportunity for visitors to see now of other historic sites along the canal. So we're really excited for that. Um, and then moving on to the next, uh, what's new is our Chesapeake Bay Storytellers program. So this is something that ties in with our Waterman heritage. Um, as you heard Ryan and, and Christy speak a little bit more about the oysters, um, you know, with oystering and crabbing, um, the Chesapeake Bay is so essential to that. Um, and this storyteller program is really a stewardship of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and what we've done is we've facilitated this certification for water-based tour guides. And this is really to encourage visitors um, and residents alike to get out on the water with these certified tour guides. Um, and it's really to tell those um, more authentic stories um, behind what not only the living watermen, um, but really the aquaculture and just everything about, um, you know, kind of what lives and breathes with the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so that'll be something fun and different. And uh, it just, again, gives people an opportunity to just get out on the water and, and hear those stories. And a lot of them are multi-generational. Um, these folks have been doing this for a very long time. Um, and then the last thing to kind of connect to that is our Annapolis Maritime Museum. So this isn't a brand new museum per se, but they've just undergone a large renovation. They were closed uh, down back in uh, October um, or fall of 2019. Um, and right now it is scheduled to open back to the public in April, of course, pending COVID. Um, so right now that's what we're sticking with is an April opening. Um, and it's really great. They've completely uh, renovated and reinvented uh, state of the art 2,500 square foot permanent exhibition space um, and it really highlights a lot of the oyster role in uh, the maritime culture uh, and the reason for more the focus on the oysters um, in this particular case is it's actually housed in the last surviving historic oyster packing plant in Annapolis so there's again a lot of the connection with the Chesapeake Bay um, and then I I'm really excited to announce that it's actually launching our first full season of public cruises along um, or on board, excuse me, on board our refurbished 1940 Chesapeake Bay Skipjack, which is called the Wilma Lee. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with the Skipjack, uh, there's a photo of it right there. It's actually, um, it was one of the last working boats on the Chesapeake Bay. It was known for dredging um, with oystering. And it is actually our Maryland official state boat as well. And with that, I would also love to introduce you to Captain Rick, 
who happens to be the captain of the Wilma Lee Skipjack with the Annapolis Maritime Museum. And he is going to walk you through how to properly crack open and pick a Maryland blue crab. Because as you all know, us Marylanders are very, very picky when it comes to uh, our crabs and how to properly eat them. So I'm going to kick it over to you, Captain Rick. Thank you, Leslie. Um, as you were just pointing out, the uh, Skipjack Romilly, I'm the uh, full-time captain aboard the Skipjack. She, there used to be over a thousand Skipjacks on the Chesapeake Bay. Today, there's only 22 that still float. And we offer uh, daily tours and special events uh, in Annapolis, which is a great historic town. Uh, it's the sailing capital of the United States. We have great restaurants. And of course, we have our Maryland blue crabs. So crabs in the wild are blue. And you can see in the photograph, hopefully. Are you guys able to see that? Okay. And uh, see how the, the paddles in the back and the legs are all blue. So they're Maryland blue crabs, but once they are cooked, they turn red. Um, and the neat thing about uh, Maryland Blue Crabs uh, is having an all day crab feast. It's a social event. Um, you, you catch the crabs with crab pots or a trot line or just dropping a line off of a duck and you steam them. Just takes a few minutes in beer. And if, speaking of beer, we have uh, our Baltimore favorite, Natty Bowes, National Bohemian. Uh, we also have believe it or not, a Guinness brewery up in Baltimore. And so we have a Guinness Baltimore Blonde. Also part of uh, the, the crab feast, you gotta have paper to cover your picnic tables. You have to have our Old Bay seasoning. People have lemons, they have bread and butter, corn, potatoes. There's just so many things uh, that you wanna have for this social event. Um, obviously, I'm having a little bottle of beer, but granted there would be pitches of beer all across the table for everybody to help themselves. Um, so everybody has their own way of picking a crab. I'm gonna show you my way, but a professional crab picker working in a, a factory, they can actually pick three crabs in a minute. That's 20 seconds a crab. Of course, the other option is you can buy a crab cake at one of our fine restaurants, but we're hopefully gonna pick this crab in 10 minutes. Hopefully you have yours in front of you. First thing you're gonna notice, we'll do a little anatomy. They have uh, 10 appendages um, and the two big claws, you wanna break off and separate and um, hold them off for later. So you're gonna turn it on its back and you're going to just twist and the big claw comes off and you're just gonna set that aside. Do that to the other side, just twist the claw. And oh, if you are lucky, you get what I call a crab popsicle. And you can just eat all of that white meat right off of the popsicle. Mmm. oh, delicious. So you're gonna set that aside. Now I grew up in Boston where we have lobster. And I have to tell you, Maryland blue crabs beat lobsters every time. Lobster, you taste the butter. Here you've got all this Old Bay seasoning, fantastic. Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna break off these other appendages. Uh, the, the back ones are the swimmers, swim flippers. Um, when you break them off, some people will save it and try and get some meat. Oh, there's a little piece. But for the most part, there's little to no meat in the um, small little legs. Uh, oh, now I, as I say that, here's a great little piece. So I'm gonna use that as a crab popsicle. Mm, delish. Hopefully you're following along with me. And at this point you've set aside the big claws and you've just put it aside and you're gonna throw away the little claws. So here's the back of the crab, eyes, the back part. Now here, this is how you can tell the gender of a crab and you're gonna use um, like a sharp knife. You could uh, even use the oyster um, knife that you got in your, 
basket. And crabs are male, female. And in Washington, we describe them uh, relative to our monuments. So this is like the Washington Monument, and this is a male. If it were a female, it's shaped like our Capitol Dome, where we recently had our inauguration. So it would be big, round, what we call the apron. So you're going to remove the apron without cutting yourself <laughs> and just set that aside. Then what you want to do is put your fingers between the back and the body underside, and you're just going to separate it. Okay, so here's the top, and you're just going to set that aside. There's nothing in there that you can eat. And what you're left with is some things that are non-edible. And the most important thing that's non-edible are these, they call them dead man's fingers, also known as the lungs. So you're just going to scrape those off. You can touch them, but you don't want to eat them. So scrape those all off. And then in the middle, there's just some junk. We won't go into uh, Science Academy and learn all the different parts. That's another class. And you're just going to uh, break off, maybe with your knife, the, the very front. So at this point, like I said, lots of paper towels. You can use your paper towel to kind of clean it up, make it look nice. You'll notice on the inside something that's yellow. What is that? Well, in Maryland, we call that mustard. And the mustard is edible, and it's really just fat. And as I said earlier, Maryland crabs burrow into the mud in the winter versus crabs down in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. So they actually are a little bit more flavorful. Um, so you're gonna just clean it out. And then what I do is I break the body in half. You can see my hands are already covered with the Old Bay seasoning. So once you start eating them, you get it on your hands and that's when you need another sip of beer. So going to crack it in half, okay? Everybody following along? I don't think we're gonna get three crabs in a minute, huh? All right, so let's get cracking here. At this point, what you can do, you notice on the underside, there's these little uh, rectangular uh, caverns, if you will, and they go all the way up and down through the body. And all you need to do is take your knife Break away some of the cartilage that may be in your way. And what you want to do is scoop in and grab the meat with your knife. And you're just going to pull it out. And I'm going to set it right here so you can see. And this particular end of the crab, that's the lump jumbo crab meat. And this is just delicious. I'm going to get a little Old Bay on top of it. Oh, I haven't had crab since the summertime and these are delicious. I hope your crabs are just as good. Um, Marilyn actually catches 56 million pounds of blue crabs every year. Um, so that's quite a few crabs that we get to eat. Okay, let me show you the, the claws real quick. You're gonna break them in half. And once again, I've got a crab popsicle. You just put that in your mouth and pull the meat off. There's actually a little cartilage in there. Just think of it as the popsicle stick. And just eat that clean. And now for the cracking of the claw, I break off the movable part of the claw, set that aside. And then you're just gonna give it one hard, but not too hard because you don't wanna smash the meat. One hard smack with your mallet, just pull it apart. And this time I'm gonna need my knife to get inside and get the crab meat. So hopefully you learned a little bit about how to pick a crab You'll have a chance to come visit us here in Maryland, Baltimore, Annapolis, to try picking crabs at any one of our great restaurants. 
And hopefully you'll come and join me on the Skipjack Wimmily for a two hour sunset sail. Scott, over to you. All right, well, Captain Rick and Ryan and Alan, uh, great information and demos today. Uh, appreciate everyone being with us and uh, certainly to all of our journalist friends in the UK. I saw many of you uh, busily working along and hopefully enjoying uh, the, the delicacies from the capital region. Uh, would love to open it up to uh, any questions. Uh, if you wanna uh, turn your camera on, turn your mic on. If you have questions for, uh, for Ryan, uh, Alan, or for Captain Rick, I would be happy to entertain those at this time. I want to hear how you all got on as well. How's, how's the crab cracking going? Could I ask a question about the oyster, please? Go okay. for it, Mark. Um, so is there a difference between the, the back of the oyster and the front of the oyster when you open them up? And it's quite difficult, obviously, the, I guess the front is the slightly bigger part, and then the back is the less uh, big part. But presumably one, one eats both, and is there any difference between the two? Um, well, actually, it's a point of preference. So this is called the cup of the oyster, the, the rounder part, the, the belly of it, if you will. And this is the flat. Um, actually, in the Chesapeake, a lot of the old time shuckers will actually serve the meat on the flat. And the way they do that is they'll they'll cut the adductor from the, the cup shell and they'll leave it attached on the flat. Because if you cut it from the flat, it would probably fall off of it. But they leave it attached on the flat and then they'll set it down like that. And then you, you bite it off of it. And that way it stays on there. They do that because the meat sits up a little more prominently on this. Um, but for, uh, for most folks, they'll serve it in the cup of the oyster because it's almost like it's, it's coming in its own spoon. And so it gets to hold all the liquor. And I think I mentioned early on that you don't have to worry about the liquor running out because actually the liquor that runs out is the liquor that was around the oyster. It's not necessarily the liquor that was in the oyster. So once you let that go, the oyster actually refills the cup and it's from the water that's inside the oyster. And so it's a much sweeter oyster at that point. The, the liquor is much more um, concentrated. So, so that's probably the reason I would say use the cup side, but biologically. And and yeah. do, you always, do you always cut the oyster in it with a, just with an ordinary knife uh, just to sort of loosen it? Yeah, I cut, you cut both sides because otherwise you're going to get a situation where you're like biting at the shell, which is never attractive and never ends well. The meat usually ends up on the floor. So yeah, you want to cut completely loose and actually use the knife to push the meat to make sure that it's completely dislodged so it'll just slide out. Right, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the interactive part because I absolutely love oysters and I love crab and that's my first time I've ever cracked open a crab by myself. So I'm feeling really, really, really proud of myself. Um, so I wanted to ask with the interactive crab. Are there workshops and options available if you're from various like restaurants or places where you can actually learn how to make it in small groups or between like one to two people? Yeah, great, great question and open to all three of you, the opportunities for, uh, for, visitors, for people to come um, to learn more and to demo and do that sort of thing. And it's, it's open to all three of you. You can answer uh, as you want. For us here at OML, um, maybe not totally Ricky involved, but uh, we are going to be doing a tequila and mezcal festival coming up and we'll be doing interactive tastings, including um, mailing out tasting kits. And then we'll have Zoom calls with some of the producers. Um, and then we can also expand that into cocktails if anybody is interested. Um, so that is something that we're looking forward to and our planning sessions actually start tomorrow. So. Uh, we're looking at doing both aspects of that and seeing how that we can package everything with detailed instructions and then hop on a call like this to be able to create a cocktail and do full tastings with the producers. So from a from an oyster perspective, the, the, the hottest seat in the house at any of our restaurants and at most oyster bars is sitting in front of the truck. Uh, so and it's, it's the same in Europe. I wouldn't imagine it being much different. Uh, that you can have a conversation and, and talk your way through it. Handing somebody a, a knife to start shucking might be a little problematic in a restaurant setting. Um, I know with the crabs, it's uh, definitely a lot more interactive and you get a lot of uh, community style tables where you're eating crabs together. And there can be a lot of sharing in that environment for sure. 
Yeah, certainly in Annapolis, Baltimore, on the Eastern shore, Ken Island, all sorts of crab houses. Uh, you sit down at a big picnic table like this and uh, people will teach you, even if you don't know them there, you're just sitting right next to them. The waiters, waitresses, everybody helps you. Thank great. You, Good. Yeah. yeah, great question. Uh, other questions, I know we, we're, we're just a couple minutes past two, but happy to stay on and uh, uh, chat um, or, or answer questions as you have them. And um, also, I want, I, yeah, I yeah, want to ask a quick, sorry, sorry, I, I mean, I know you can't answer this question. I'm not asking for an official answer on the record. Um, I was wondering, once you get an idea of how hopeful you're feeling and when, when do you think you're going to see international tourists back in the capital region? What's your, what's your sort of hopeful scenario on that? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Chris, and, and, and certainly our PR committee can jump in here as, as well as needed. But no, we are feeling very hopeful. I mean, uh, you know, anytime we, we try to stay pretty apolitical, but uh, anytime a new administration comes in, you know, there's hope around that. There's hope just around the calendar changing. I think everybody was glad to see it was no longer 2020. Uh, so even just that. Uh, but certainly as um, vaccines are rolled out uh, more widely, uh, both here and there, um, and as testing ramps up and becomes uh, easier, faster, cheaper for travelers, you know, we, we believe there's going to be a combination of that. If you saw the news today about um, requirements for a negative COVID test to, to enter the U.S., um, having a negative test within three days, um, you know, I think procedures like that are just going to continue to evolve as they have. But uh, I think we're hopeful that, you know, it'd be great. I, I mean, it's hard to have a crystal ball, but um, more steady travel by this summer or a reopening by this summer, I think, is, uh, is a realistic goal. Uh, late spring is probably a little ambitious, but that'd be great. But certainly by next fall, which is a great time uh, to come to the capital region, uh, we hope to see a return of travelers. Uh, our research shows that it's probably going to be late 2023 to early 2024 to return to 2019 levels uh, for, for overseas travelers from our market. So that's just the, the reality that we're in. But we know the Brits are resilient travelers. They're great travelers. Uh, we love them and we have great shared history. So can't wait to have them back. So sorry, that was a little long winded. No, no, you, you, sound, you sound positive, which is always good at the moment. So I'm, I'm, pleased, to, I'm pleased to hear that. I have a question. Oh, yeah. I'll pilot just from the restaurant perspective, um, it was really interesting to see this past summer, even you know, in the in the thick of it, not as if we're not now, um, but just how how people were resourceful and so much started to lean outside. I think we're starting to create a, a really inviting environment outdoors as well, which makes COVID safe, um, you know, vacation. So we're we're getting. Everywhere in the world, we're getting pretty ingenious with how to do things outside safely. Um, I just wanted to ask. It's been a really nice evening, so thank you. Um, when visitors are, you know, coming to the capital regions, and um, where do they start with their trips? Do they visit all three, or is it one out of the two? How does it tend to work for visitors? Sure, you know, for those who are visiting just the capital region, and we um, obviously have many that do so, uh, they usually average about nine to 10 nights overall in the region. And so that breaks down nicely into about three per destination. Uh, most people I believe start usually in DC um, and then go out to Maryland and Virginia from there. And some of its preference, we have great beach sites along the Atlantic. Obviously the Chesapeake Bay is a major feature. Uh, wonderful national parks, the Appalachian Mountains run through. We've got great wineries and food culture. Obviously, you've seen a great slice of that today. But um, yeah, it takes about nine to 10 days. But if you've only got a, if you want a city break in DC, you can do that. Uh, if you want to get out and do road trips, we've got great loop tours through Maryland and Virginia as well. Uh, so it really depends. And then we know, obviously, that others are take it in as part of a longer uh, East Coast vacation, whether they're working through the the, the major cities, Boston, New York, Philly, uh, Baltimore, DC, and down the coast, so. And, um, I have a really quick, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, no, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead, Stephanie. I just wanted to find out a bit more about the Harriet Tubman anniversary next year as well. Can visitors actually do some parts of the Underground Railroad bits that she traveled through? Or is it something that's been looked into? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so yeah, so we actually have a Harriet Tubman themed scenic byway 
Um, so that actually is more along the eastern shore outside of uh, Cambridge is where she, um, that area on our eastern shore is where she was born and enslaved. Um, and that's where the National State Park kind of combination, the Harriet Tubman State Park, National Park, um, it, uh, resides. Um, that opened a few years ago. Um, and then part of the Network to Freedom site is that they have those Underground Railroad sites all over the state. Um, and actually, I mean, it goes all across like the eastern um, seaboard, really. Um, but we're just, you know, one big portion of that. So there's multiple ways to go around and travel through that. We also in Maryland have a few different driving tours set up that will hit on some of those specific sites. So if you want it specific to just Tubman, um, there's also, you know, other folks we have with Frederick Douglass and just some, some of the other um, conductors that were, you know, very much in line with Underground Railroad. So um, visitors, a lot of times will seek those areas out. Um, what's really nice too is with uh, DC with the African American um, Smithsonian, there's also parts of Tubman's story in that as well as there's some of the stories down in Virginia. So although Maryland sort of has a higher I guess, concentration of those areas and that site specific to Tubman. Uh, for folks who do travel within the whole region, there is opportunity to hear and see some of those stories across the whole area. So Amazing. hopefully that answers. And with her, her birthday specific next uh, year, uh, Maryland actually has September is coined on National Underground Railroad Month. Um, so we, we sort of really, you know, I guess kind of go all, go all out here in Maryland um, in regards to that. Um, but yeah, because they don't have her specific date of birth, uh, we just know what month she she was born in. Um, that's why it's sort of just open ended with just the month of March. Amazing, thank you, Farida. I believe that you um, that you had a question. I I think yes, please. Hi, <laughs> um, thank you so much for tonight, everybody. I've had a really wonderful time. Um, everything was so, so delicious. Um, Stephanie uh, touched on my question just a little bit, but as someone who's never been to the capital region, if I wanted to plan a road trip, because I just love road trips, and I wanted it to be really food and wine focused, I have seven days to hit all of the best food and winery spots in the region. Can you tell me like three, four, five of your favorite places that I just shouldn't miss? Well, actually, I'll turn this over to uh, our, our partner reps as well. If they each want to take a minute or two. Uh, I don't know if they'll be able to narrow it down to a few favorites, but it's a good <laughs> for them. So yeah, who wants, who'd like to go first? I'll go first. I'll just touch on the fact that um, for DC, we were excited a few years ago to be um, one of only four destinations in the U.S. with the Michelin Guide. So I think it's really um, a fun opportunity to be able to check off um, one of those restaurants in the book and they have, we have um, some bib gourmand options, which are more, you know, the more affordable category. So I would definitely suggest that. Um, and what's great about the Michelin Guide, and one thing that was really exciting for us is that they are scattered throughout um, DC in different neighborhoods. So it will give you an opportunity to get off the National Mall and um, and explore, you know, how, how the locals live. And and as we have Alan here, I, I wasn't kidding when I said Oyamel is one of my favorite restaurants in DC, um, some of the best uh, Mexican food in the city. <laughs> and I'll jump in off of that as well to point out that um, for uh, the Michelin Guide, the one three star that's actually in the Michelin Guide for DC is, is in Virginia. It's the Inn at Little Washington. Um, and is definitely worth a drive. It's about an hour 15 drive out of an hour 30 out of DC, but definitely well worth the trip. And then there are a variety of really um, restaurants that are really getting a lot of um, uh, exposure by US uh, entities as well. And a lot of those are in Richmond. You'll find those in Richmond. You'll find those in the Shenandoah Valley as well. And of course, you've seen you know, the oyster uh, loveliness. We have an entire Virginia oyster trail. So you could go along that and experience. There's uh, opportunities there to do oyster day camps where you literally are submerged into the oyster world and you go out on the boats. 
Um, you can do a trip out to a farm where they do a chef's table experience and you can walk into the water with the waiters and they'll help you with the shucking and, and you know, you can bring your own wine. So lots of different from city opportunities to more rural opportunities, farm to table, water to table, all of that is very common in Virginia. And I can't narrow it down further than that, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, that's amazing. Hi, yeah, hi guys. It's very... Oh, oh, Leslie, sorry. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, quick question say, from Ash. Sorry, Karen. Karen, Leslie, I interrupted. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll just answer real quickly. Yeah, similar to, to what Christy said with Virginia, um, it's very similar with Maryland in the sense that we have a very diverse food culture as well. Um, Baltimore and Frederick have actually a pretty bustling uh, culinary scene. Um, so, and it really just, I think, depends um, on what the kind of the type of uh, experience that you want, because we can do a lot with uh, the seafood side of it. We can do um, you know, a lot with our Eastern Shore, getting out into the water and doing some more of that experiential. And then, of course, we've got a lot of the um, agricultural side with all of our farming um, and everything set up with that. So can't really narrow it down, but I know we have more questions. So we'll, we'll jump to that. I think it was Ashwin had had a question so we can jump to him. Yep, Ashwin, go ahead. Hi guys, thanks so much for this evening. Uh, we use it as a centerpiece to uh, to have like a, a lovely seafood dining experience. So thanks very much. You inspired us to go down the shop and get a load more oysters. So we learned how to shuck oysters together. So thanks for that, guys. <clears throat> if if one comes to DC, how easy is it? You know, I've heard about a lot of the museums being fully booked out in advance. Obviously, that's not a specific challenge right now. What's a process people go through in order to make sure they get space at the big national museums, how much time in advance do you need to book for those? And from DC itself, is it quite easy to then get out into sort of wilderness to do multi-day hikes? How far would one have to go to reach that? And those are my two questions, thank you. Oh, thank you. I think we can uh, start with Vanessa on the first question uh, and then Leslie and Christy can, can pick it up from there. So uh, yeah, great questions. Yeah, so um, pre-COVID, um, the African American Museum was actually the only Smithsonian Museum that had timed passes. So um, aside from that one, you could just walk into to any museum. Um, we expect once um, you know safety protocols are a little bit um, less uh, less uh, strict, that we'll see that come back as well. Um, and if, as far as the other paid museums, um, it's uh, pretty easy to to walk up and get a ticket the day of. And in regards to getting out into the wilderness, um, it, it's really short. <laughs> Literally, um, some of our scenic drives, the George Washington Memorial Parkway runs just on the other side of DC in Virginia along the Potomac River. And if you start heading west, you'll come to Great Falls National Park within a 20 minute, 15, 20 minute drive out of DC. And you can literally, uh, Maryland is on one side of the park, Virginia is on the other side of the park. So you can easily see, you know, just beautiful hiking along the Potomac River, watch the uh, literally stand up whitewater paddle boarders and kayakers going through the rapids. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, but you can get to Shenandoah National Park in roughly an hour or two. So multi-day hikes for the kind of thing you're talking about. And of course, in Shenandoah National Park, you also have access to the Appalachian, Nat, uh, Appalachian Trail. So lots and tons of access. And Leslie, if you want to throw in on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. As Christy echoed, it's, it's pretty much the same on the Maryland side. Um, I think the, the great part about our region is that there is so much in such a small condensed area. So you really can, even driving um, maybe two, three hours outside of DC going westward, um, I mean, you're pretty much at the western border in the western mountains of Maryland. So, um, and as Christy said with the Appalachian Trail, uh, there's also the Great Allegheny Passage and the Sino Canal, which I had spoken about earlier, the Great Falls Tavern that, that Christy just mentioned. That's pretty much the start of the Sino Canal. Um, and then it heads into Georgetown out west into Maryland. Um, and even from D.C. to get to Annapolis, which will put you right there on the Chesapeake Bay, it's, it's less than an hour drive. Um, it could be, you know, 30 minutes even by train sometimes. So um, it's, it's fairly quick and it's easy to get to, very accessible. Yeah, 
And, and Vanessa, just to circle back to you, do you want to talk a little bit about DC's open spaces too? I think sometimes people are surprised at the uh, uh, the amount of parks and, and spaces that are available in, in an urban area. Yeah, um, we have a lot of green space around the city. I'll just call it Rock Creek Park, um, which is our biggest uh, park and actually twice the size of Central Park in New York City. A lot of people don't know that we have that big park running through. Um, so lots of hiking, um, horseback riding options there. Um, I used to live right by it. It was truly, every time I walked through it, I couldn't believe that I was still in DC. Um, just all that nature right, right in the heart of the city. And you can get down to visit Ryan in about, I think it's about an hour and a half to two hours because you got to head into the Chesapeake Bay down to the Rappahannock River. So, right, Ryan, about two hours from DC? Give or take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just uh, kind of a, a, a one final comment on, on that line too, and um, the, the reps had hinted at this, but we're not just geographically close knit, but something that's been good in this era and will, you know, it's going to be with us probably for the next couple of years is that the governors of Maryland and Virginia and the mayor of DC have worked really closely together uh, on their COVID protocols and safety standards and things like that. So when visitors do start to return, uh, they're going to see some nice consistency around the region. Um, I think they're going to feel safe traveling. Um, you know, our airports, Dulles Airport's the main gateway. We also have a BWI in Baltimore. Uh, you know, they've got great standards uh, in place for, for traveler safety. So, um, you know, we're excited when the time comes for people to come back that those, uh, those standards of, uh, of care are in place. But other questions? Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm going to have to duck out now, but thanks for an awesome evening. And um, yeah, definitely I'll be getting in touch with you guys about doing a sort of mix of city and adventure. Cheers. Catch you later. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks, Ashman. Hey, guys. Uh, I was quickly going to ask about thanks so much for all the crab, by the way. I've been work. This is my last bit, and I've got a whole bowl. Um, I wanted to ask you guys mentioned Amtrak at the beginning, celebrating 50th, I think, anniversary. Yep. Uh, from my experience of visiting the US, which is only a couple of times, it's definitely advisable to get a higher car. <laughs> um, do you think realistically the train can be a part of your trip, like a key part of the transport for your trip? Like would it re realistically be possible to explore the area by using just Amtrak or would you need to combine it with a car hire as well? No, I'll jump in on that. Only you guys just because, um, so you can, you can get from Dulles International Airport in Virginia to Alexandria, where you can catch the train, or even Manassas, both in Virginia, where you can catch the train in less than an hour. Um, drive, you know, via a cab or you know a um, um, Uber, Uber or something like that. So you can easily get to the train station, and then from the train station, you can go into DC. I should note too, mind you, the Metro Rail again will start from D from IAD, Washington Dulles International, and go straight to a variety of the different Amtrak stations as well. So forget the Uber and cab. I should point that out. You can jump on Metro Rail, go straight to let's say Alexandria because the stations are right near each other, and jump on the train, and then you could go into DC. You could go over to Baltimore or you can go deeper into Virginia and go as close, you know, down to Norfolk, which is right near Virginia Beach. So you can go the ocean side, or you can take a different route and go into the mountains to Roanoke, which is in Virginia's Blue Ridge and do all of the outdoor, you know, along the Blue Ridge Parkway and everything. So we've done trips like that for journalists where they don't drive and they literally um, take the train. If any of you know Steve Hartridge, he did it not too long ago and did a great story on it. So just throwing that out there, it's absolutely positively something you can do. I, um, just to jump in, I, I did it last year when I was lucky enough to come over. I got the train for quite a lot of my trip. So um, great Wi-Fi, much better than our UK train. So I definitely recommend it. Nice. I want the um, definitely up for the canal booze tasting as well. <laughs> My ears pricked up for that. <laughs> we have lots of booze tasting around here. <laughs> Don't we ladies? Yeah. Yes, you do. And, and, and just, to, just to add on to what Chrissy said with Amtrak, um, 
with the Maryland side, I mean, you can, there's two main lines there. So there's the Baltimore connection, and then there's actually a separate Amtrak line that takes you up into Frederick and into Western Maryland. Um, and a lot of times you'll see folks who, um, if they use an outfitter to rent a bike or something like that, that you can actually bring your bike on the Amtrak as well. So that's another kind of bonus with that. I think in Maryland, the only part you can't really get to by train is the Eastern shore. Once you get to the, the bay, there's not really much you can do. Um, other than crossing over the Bay Bridge, but Amtrak does have some partnerships with other um, transportation um, that is available, some other options as well through Amtrak. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great question. So, others? All right. Well, just want to say certainly a big thank you uh, to each of you for spending some of your evening with us today. Uh, certainly, thank you to uh, Ryan, Allen, and Captain Rick for sharing their great expertise for us and uh, uh, showing you a little slice of the, the, the culinary uh, scene in the Capital Region. Appreciate our friends from Brighter, of course, and our uh, state and DC partners uh, for being on. A great evening. Um, put together. Yeah, Ryan. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, but no, uh, last call, literally, for any, any other questions or any other comments from anyone. I'd just like to say thank you. Good to see everyone. This was my holiday that genuinely, just not just because they were a client, this would have been our family holiday last year, as Scott well knows. So it's absolutely on the list as soon as we can get there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And appreciate your team and all the great work you're doing for us there. So uh, have a great evening, everyone. Enjoy those, uh, those oysters and the crabs and the, uh, the, the gin ricky. Uh, think of us, and we'll certainly look forward to welcoming you to the region when uh, we're able to do that again. But uh, have a great evening there, and uh, good thoughts for the future. Uh, I'm very optimistic. So good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B